Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1977 Italian giallo film, Watch Me When I Kill. And if there's one thing that I like about giallo films, it's that they get into the kills quickly. And this film actually does that. Uh, it doesn't mean that this is like the best or even in my top giallo films, but it's it was okay. And I will say with what the end of the film ended up being, that made me feel even better about the film than I was feeling going into the ending of it. Uh, it does get heavy, though. That's the crazy thing. So I did watch this through Giallo Realm on YouTube, so you can check that out. There's a lot of Giallo on that YouTube channel. This one's directed by Antonio Bito, who also directed Blue Tornado and The Bloodstained Shadow, which I will be doing a review on The Bloodstained Shadow at some point, probably soon. Uh, written by Beto as well as Roberto Natal, who also who wrote scripts for The Seven Revenges, Terror Creatures from the Grave, Bloody Pit of Horror, Kill Baby Kill, which is one of my favorites, uh, Italian film-wise, one of my favorites, and I think potentially the best Mario Bava film ever made, so the fact that he was involved with that script says a lot, and Twisted Girls. And then Vittorio Chiraldi is also involved with this. He wrote Diamonds Are a Man's Best Friend, She and He, and Blue Nude. Who knew? This is also known as Terror in the Lagoon and The Vote of Death. Uh, I think that Watch Me When I Kill sounds better, but at the same time, does it really tie into the film? Not really, but that's okay. So right off the bat, Santori, the pharmacist assistant, is such a creepy dude that I immediately thought, this guy's so creepy, this guy's so sketchy, so suspicious, that he's obviously supposed to be one of the big red herrings, if not the biggest red herring in there. And that ends up being a case, although there are a lot of red herring individuals that do get thrown out there. I think Dazan ends up being the second big one that kind of shows up here. But Santori is obviously the very first one. And then they have... Well, I'll talk about that in a little bit. The scene with Dazan and Santori, but I'll talk about that. Pretty quick kill for Dazan. Uh, doesn't look great either. Um, yeah. Oh, no, I didn't mean Dazan. I meant Bozzy as the other big red herring. Yeah, Dazan's the pharmacist who gets killed early on. Uh, real quick kill for Dazan. It didn't look good. It wasn't a really good kill. Um, it was kind of quick. I like everything leading up to that kill, how he was kind of like alone in his pharmacy and kind of like pacing around. There was a good tension to it, and then he gets nailed. But, um, you know, the whack on the head was super fast. The blade across the throat looked terrible, basically. But, you know, it was the 70s. What do you, what do you expect? They introduced a lot of characters very quick, uh, but this is actually a very perfect way for them to have the killer get lost in the shuffle, which is obviously what exactly what they do. Uh, I feel like introducing so many characters, like kind of rapid fire, was definitely their way to slip Carlo in there real quick. Carlo was with Michele, uh, and they were pitching a script, basically. And it made me think I was very suspicious of Carlo because he made some weird comments kind of like something about um, Mara being like the big star and kind of the looks he was giving her and how fixated he was on her. I kind of had a feeling that he would end up being the killer. Also, with like I was saying, introducing so many characters real quick and the fact that Michele and Carlo were just kind of thrown in there real quick with something that seemed like it didn't really matter at all. And then they were gone for a while, uh, for a long while. So I was thinking back to that and I'm just like, it's got to be Carlo. And I was right, it was Carlo, but it also wasn't that simple, which is why I like the ending, because I did guess ultimately the actual killer, but I didn't guess all the motive, who could have seen that coming really, and the somewhat involvement of uh, Carlo's father, the judge, who actually doesn't even have a name in this, he's just known on IMDb as judge, so yeah. The song that starts playing when the killer is moving in on Mara, I swear I've heard in other Giallo films before, but it could just be because it's a kind of goblin-esque ripoff, uh, and that's probably why it sounds so good too. I mean, the score in this, in general, sounds good, and I kind of wish we would have gotten more scores for Italian film and Giallo films in particular from the people who did this uh, with Trans Europa Express was the name of that group. And it's like two people made it up. And I think this was the only film they did a score for, actually. 
Um, but like I said, I wish they had been in more because they rip off Goblin and it sounds wonderful. I love it. This this does have a good score and I'm I'm happy about that. Such a weird shot of Esmeralda looking up at Lucas when they first meet in the hallway at the apartment complex when Esmeralda's with Bozy. Um, they keep showing her face like uncomfortably close. The first time is when Esmeralda ends up meeting Lucas and obviously Mara's with him. But like it's like the super close up on her face and she like looks up. And then when she's in the apartment with Bozzy, it's then done numerous times too. And it, it, it's just like a weird shot. It's too close. I don't know what the point of it was. And that kind of goes to another thing with this film in general. The directing and cinematography isn't the best. Like, it's not bad by any stretch of the imagination. There are, you know, a few visual flares that get thrown in, in there here and there. And some good cinematography from time to time. But when you, th when you think about Giallo films and a lot of the Giallo films that have, you know, persisted over time and people know about, they look really good. There's great directing. There's great cinematography. So this one in comparison, ends up standing out as not being that great. Um, it's not that it's bad, it's just that the other ones are so good, they look so great that when this one's closer on the average side, it just kind of, in comparison, doesn't look so hot. So, yeah. The scene trying to decipher the audio recording I thought was pretty cool. Um, I'm always looking for some sort of, like, interesting scene in a Giallo film that I haven't seen anywhere before. Um, like the, one of the ones I did recently, uh, I forget which one it was where they had the glass blowing happening. Like it just seemed like it was something interesting. They just throw in there and Giallo's just keep doing that. They'll have some sort of scene that like didn't need to be in the film necessarily, but they do it because it's kind of interesting. And the, the going through the audio deciphering what's going on there kind of seemed like that was one of those scenes, but it was cool. I liked it. I thought it was interesting and something different. I dig the shot of when Esmeralda was walking down her hallway and then you see the shadowy figure leaning against the wall behind her. Obviously, we end up finding out that that's a coat rack and like a trench coat with a hat on top uh, in the dark, but it looked cool. It looked cool, and I thought it would actually end up being the killer. I kind of wished it was, but um, still a good, you know, solid fake out that they have going on there. Esmeralda leaves a message that she needs to, to talk to Bozy. By Giallo rules, she then has to die, and as we know, she ends up dying. And it's in interesting fashion, too. Uh, much like Bozzi, Giovanni, later, um, <laughs> he gets an interesting death. She gets an even more interesting death, in my opinion, because she gets her face just, like, repeatedly shoved into f into scalding food with the, the oven door open. I thought he was just going to, like, hold her head in the oven and bake the whole head. But the fact that it just keeps going in the food, I guess, works, too. And that just burned her up and killed her. Um, I don't know if that would be the case, but, you know, if you do it long enough, I guess. He could have suffocated her, too, because there was plenty of liquid in that pan. Just saying. With how vague the meeting of Giovanni and Santori is, it makes you believe it's just to drum up suspicion. I think that truly was the situation. That's basically uh, a lot before you end up finding out that Bozzi, uh, Giovanni is, uh, I'll just keep calling him Bozzi. Bozzi is basically a loan shark, and that's why he was meeting with Santori. But they show the scene without that context. So it truly was there to make it look like something very suspicious is going on. So to kind of make you be like, look, Bozy's very suspicious right now. Santori's very suspicious right now. Right now, It could be either of these guys. They could be one of the killers. Or they could be in league together. So I think that works to kind of, you know, throw the suspicion. Uh, so the person trying to kill Bozy was going to beat him to death with a wrench through his car. This seems like a thin idea. The one where Mara's kind of moving the car for Bozy in the parking garage. And then all of a sudden the wrench comes out and starts bashing the windows and she wrecks his car after saying she wouldn't get a scratch on it, which I thought was funny. Um, so that was the plan for the killer to just like wrench him to death through the car? It just seems like a thin plan. It seems like it wouldn't really work. And so I think they thought the idea of like the wrench, you know, messing up the car would look cool. And that's probably how they got to that. But um, it just, just doesn't seem like a good plan as far as the killer goes. 
I like how Lucas spots a potential motive and then just makes a very intri uh, a very base assumption immediately that Ferrante would end up being the killer because of his trial and the fact that people who are on the jury are getting killed. Obviously, later we find out that's because the judge was trying to put names to faces to figure out who it was who sold his family out to the Nazis, uh, which is a, a very interesting twist. Uh, and then the coffee cup, where he realizes that Ferrante's not the killer. I didn't really, I couldn't really follow that. It seemed very half baked. Where he's kind of like, oh no, it's not Ferrante because when I was at his place, there were two coffee cups and they were sitting like this, and his wife uh, was was grabbing it with her right hand, and then somehow that means that he's left-handed. I was like, I don't. I mean, you could point it out to me if I just kind of missed it or didn't pick up on it or I'm being too dense, but put it in the comments. I don't. I didn't get that. That was like a weird thing. I don't know. When Mara's looking at costumes at the cabaret to pick out what she's going to wear in that kind of like attic-y looking place, note that there was a duck painted on the wall behind her. I'm thinking this is kind of a nod to Lucio Fulci films uh, Don't Torture a Duckling as well as The New York Ripper, which features that exact looking duck heavily in those films, and they have ties to the killers in both those films so I thought that was a cool kind of easter egg that's thrown in there I don't know if that was intentional or not but it seems like it probably would be to me just saying um nice misdirection with the killer murdering Paolo instead of Mara in that area where she's looking at the costumes I thought for sure that he was coming for Mara but he ends up killing Paolo but was that intentional I don't know because they never talk about what what had happened with Paolo. They kind of talk about, uh, like, Esmeralda and uh, Bozy and uh, Dazan, you know, them actually having ties to the whole Nazi situation, but they don't talk about Paolo. It kind of seems like maybe he was just an innocent bystander. Like, maybe he just happened to see Carlo. Oh, or actually, this just dawned on me, it's quite possible that he was mad because Paolo had... Uh, closeness with Mara because Carlo does talk about wanting to be with Mara like having interest in Mara to some degree so just throwing that out there uh, Bozzi's tub strangling scene is pretty drawn out although it is shot well I do believe I think it goes on too long but I think kind of the quick shots and like the close-ups and the flailing and everything really does make it seem more violent so the fact that they were able to bring that through the screen I think does work quite well. Uh, I'm a fan of that. Uh, nice random madman in the rundown building when, um, oh, what's his name? I'm not even referencing him much. Lucas, I haven't referenced him much. Uh, when Lucas is, is going around looking for, he was supposed to meet up with someone at that point. Um, he goes into this abandoned building and there's just this random madman like speaking gibberish and then laughing at him. And then the window falls out of the building and I was just like, okay just random but it was fun I like how Lucas just walks right into the sister's place and starts poking around and nobody stops him eventually someone does say something one of the caretakers I believe but this is when he was poking around trying to get that information he eventually gets about um, the family uh, being given up to the Nazis who were hiding out there um, but the fact that he just like walks in there were a lot of people hanging out in the main room there and they don't say anything to him and then he just starts poking around the house it's like okay not a bad twist to have Ferrante show up and appear to be after Mara when he's actually there to keep her safe uh, I do think that was an interesting kind of like quick red herring that goes on there you're like oh no it's Ferrante and then you're like oh no he's trying to save Mara but then it doesn't make a whole lot of sense why he would be helping Lucas really um, I guess we're supposed to just believe that from the one scene that Lucas and Ferrante were in together, that uh, they became friends all of a sudden. Friends so much so that Ferrante would just be like, you want me to stand outside in the dark and watch over your home so that no one comes after this woman? Sure. It's weird. It's, it, does, it doesn't make sense. But that, you know, that's Giallo. And a lot of Giallo things just happen just because, often. Wow. The ending was heavy stuff. The judge stacking the jury to see the faces of the people who wanted to go after him, after his, uh, after them, 
for giving up his family to the Nazis. I didn't see that coming. Like I said, it got heavy. Like, I didn't see that coming. I'm sure nobody who sees this for the first time really sees all that coming. But, I mean, that's heavy material to throw in there. Like, anytime you introduce Nazis into the situation, especially in a situation like this where it was Nazi sympathizer, sympathizers that gave up a family that was then taken away to concentration camps and murdered... Because that's what the noises were that Carlo had left on Bozzi's answering machine, or no, that he had called him with and Bozzi had recorded, was like the sounds of a concentration camp. I think it was like a, a train going and then the Dobermans at the concentration camp and just, that was supposed to jog his memory as like a you know why I'm coming after you type thing. So it's heavy. It was, I wasn't expecting that. And that made me appreciate the film even more because they were willing to go there and do something more serious when the film didn't seem as serious, if that makes sense. Depressing ending, though. The ultimate ending is depressing, where when the judge makes the call to shoot his son, Carlo, and then shoot himself in the head, and it's like, these are the only two survivors from that whole situation. And I guess the, the shame that the judge feels from the fact that Carlo took what he was going to do and try and bring these people to justice through the courts, but taken into his own hands and actually murder, he just was so shamed by it that he killed Carlo and then killed himself because, well, he probably killed himself because, one, his role in kind of enabling Carlo to a degree and just feeling that guilt, but also, two, just the the awful feeling of just killing your own son. I mean, and he, I get, he just couldn't live with that, so just depressing what a depressing ending i can't think of a more depressing giallo ending than that right now although maybe you can so you can put it down in the comments and let me know uh like i said really dig the music which wish the trans europa express had done more uh they threw a lot of random suspicious looking guys in this film which uh makes the guessing more fun in my opinion like i said i did kind of guess on carlo but there were times after I had initially seen Carlo where I was like, oh, well, maybe this person, oh, well, maybe this person. In the end, I did settle back on Carlo. But the fact that you go through that and you're like, well, maybe this, well, maybe this, like, that's the whole point. You know, you're supposed to second guess yourself. You're supposed to at least for a little bit consider these other characters. And that's why there are so many characters in it, so many suspicious looking characters as well. But if you've ever seen Giallo before, you know that it's never the characters who seem suspicious. It's always the characters in the end who don't really seem suspicious. Maybe they get a little bit suspicious here or there, but not to any big degree. Uh, lots of Giallo films have real artistic flair with the directing, but not this one. That does bear repeating, because like I said, uh, it stands out. It's just not looking nearly as great as other Giallo films, but... That said, I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, once the twist happens at the end and the ending, how it is, how heavy it is, how emotional it is, how depressing it is, made me appreciate it even more and like it even more. So uh, made me upgrade it to a three out of five stars, and that is with half stars in play. So three out of five stars for Watch Me When I Kill. Uh, enjoy it. Would love to hear from you all. Your thoughts on Watch Me When I Kill, go ahead and put it down in the comments. Oh, also something I need to say really quick. Since this was in 1977, this is significantly past the prime popularity of Giallo. I mean, the prime... Giallo kind of died out around 1974. So this is coming like three years after Giallo had kind of died out as being popular. So it's just kind of interesting to see these ones that came later. I think maybe part of the reason that um, they felt like they could do this one is because they did have this this interesting, uh, different ending with making it so heavy about the Nazi sympathizers. So, um, yeah, solid stuff. But like I said, would love to hear your opinions on this, but just any Giallo in general as well. Uh, do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. It takes you a second. It's totally painless, and it really means a lot to me. Uh, we're building this nerdy horror community right here. And you're keeping me motivated when you subscribe. Truly you are. And it shows you you appreciate what I'm doing. So anyway, uh, do thank you for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.